and welcome to The Curling Show, the podcast that brings you interviews with the sports top athletes and the people who shape the game. I'm Dean Gemmel, and in this edition, we talk to a thrower of Skips Rocks out of Alberta, whose team has had quite a ride this season. Currently number four on the Asham World Curling Tour Order of Merit, number five in the CTRS point standings and runner-up at last weekend's National in Port Hawkesbury, Nova Scotia, Blake McDonald, Team Kevin Cooey, welcome to The Curling Show. Thanks, Dean. Well, Blake, you've had the kind of season that 98% of the world's curlers would be thrilled about, and yet it's been more than a little painful at times. Uh, with just a couple of big events left on the schedule, what are your thoughts on the year? Um, well, it's kind of what we expected. You know, we weren't really going into this year looking at a lot of results uh, with a brand new team and four pretty, you know, reasonably young guys. We were more, more just looking for some cohesiveness and uh, to get some games in and to get into some big situations so we can start building some experience and, and have something to draw on down the road. We're more looking at this year in terms of getting better and the, and the caliber of the caliber of play that we're, we're bringing to the rink every game. And so in a lot of respects, this has been a pretty successful year from that standpoint. So the cohesiveness has happened this year for you guys? Yeah, we get along pretty good, and uh, we've, we've had a lot of fun and um, certainly learned a lot about each other. And, um, you know, we've all worked pretty hard, too. So, I mean, if you'd have seen us the first field of the year, I think we were probably the worst team in the world. You got a hundred bucks at the Shorty Jenkins. We did, and it was a is a generous hundred bucks. <laughs> you lost to Team China, but other than that, four ends actually is as, as, as it turned out. So it was, you know, we we've come a long way since then, and uh, you know, as long as we keep getting better, I think that it's gonna it's gonna be a good thing for us. So well, you know, and I think if you look over history, uh, a lot of good teams really don't come barging out of the gates of first year, and 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 in fact, some teams that start hot end up struggling a bit at the end, like Kerry Burtnick's team this year. Yeah, and I can't really speak for Kerry's team because they're just, you know, that's a great team. But, you know, we're, we're more really concerned about ourselves. And, you know, we kind of, we, we had some goals for this year, which was, you know, just to, to learn about each other and, and to get some things figured out. And we've changed a lot in terms of deliveries and, you know, a whole lot of different other things as well. So it's um, been a pretty good good process this year. So hey, how, how did deliveries change for you guys? What did you guys do? Um, I've changed a couple things, you know, with respect to, being able to play on on better ice surfaces, you know, just making sure that the that the rock runs a little bit truer and that uh, you know there's a has the same breaking point as the rest of the guys. But other than that, I mean, you know, we've all kind of you know tried to start throwing the you know reasonably the same, and and you know when you when you start doing that, that that takes a lot of work and it it takes time too. It seems to me that your team has moved into the position in Alberta most likely to challenge Martin and Furby in any given week. Uh, with all due respect to, say, Mark Johnson, Don Walchuk's rink in whatever form that may take, Kurt Balderson, and any number of other very good Alberta teams. But with your struggles against Kevin and to some degree Randy, this year was it a, a struggle at times to overcome, you know, lack of confidence? Uh, I think early on it really was. You know, those are two of the best teams in the history of the game, so it's no slouch to go out and, and get your, your butt handed to you by them. But but certainly, with respect um, to you know the later part of this year, I really think we've uh, we played well against them. I think we've won our last four out of six meetings against those two teams. So you know we're we're starting to get to the point where we can certainly compete against them and uh, and have some pretty good games. And uh, again, you know those are the two best teams in the world. And and if you can beat them fifty percent or better, you know you're doing pretty well. How important was it to beat Randy Furby's team twice in one event? Yeah, I think that was really good for us. I mean, like I said, those are <laughs> one of the best teams in history. So it's uh, it's it's nice to see that we can we can put together good games against them now and and compete. You know, we still got a long ways to go, but it's nice to see the results this early on. You might get a question for a quibble from Glenn Howard about calling them the two best teams in the world right now, but well, you know, to, to be honest with you, there's really three teams in the world. There's two teams that we see all the time, right? Right. Um, and, and, I mean, we've played Martin and Furby a total combined uh, amount of 17 times this year. So, you know, we, we certainly see those teams a lot more. I think we've only played Glenn twice. So no, no offense to Glenn. I mean, certainly he's proven that they're, they're in the upper echelon. It's just, you know, we just don't see him as much. Speaking of playing in Alberta, are there times when you wish you weren't playing there and were battling for, say, the Newfoundland title? Absolutely not. With, without a doubt, not. And I think Mark Johnson would even tell you that you know the reason why we're we're where we are and we're we're able to compete and 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 play against these guys is because we get to play against them 17 times in a year. 
you know, you learn a lot about playing those guys, and you learn a lot about yourself. And, you know, they challenge you even when you think you have them beat, like we did in provincials. They make you shoot, and they make you make that shot. And, you know, they, you know, might not, might seem like an easy shot, but they've made you select a line that's maybe not so easy. So, you know, they're, they're great teams, and you, you can learn a lot about rock positioning and uh, just doing the little things better and, and what you need to do to beat great teams. So. Hey, difficult as it might be, that let's talk for a moment about that Alberta Provincial Final. Anybody who's curled in some sort of serious way can relate to that kind of agony. How long did it take you to get over that, or have you gotten over that? Oh, absolutely. Um, it took me, uh, I mean, I still wake up at night and wish I hadn't done it, but you can't go back in time, right? It's what you do with it, and, and it's what you learn from it that, that's important. Uh, you know, we were even talking about it in the van on the way home from Port Hawkesbury last weekend, and... And, you know, Carter had a great comment, which was, you know, I'd take, I'd take everything this year. I'd even take the, that loss because, you know, it's just going to, it's given us lots to talk about and lots to learn from in terms of being in that situation again. And um, three years from now, if, if we can learn from it and use it and uh, use it to get where we want to go, that's, that's, I mean, it's been a good thing then. Did you, did you hear Russ Howard on the podcast talk about losing four Briar finals and six provincial finals? Yeah, well, you know what? Um, I talked to Glenn last weekend over a beer about that, and, and you know, he had some really nice things to say, and he was really encouraging, and uh, I, uh, you know, I got a lot of respect for him, and, and so, uh, you know, I've even, a lot of other players as well, I've, I've discussed it with, Kerry Burtnick, and, you know, th- those guys make you feel pretty good about it, because they've all done it too at some point, so it's what you do with it, and it, it's learning from it, and it's not dwelling on it, and, um, you know, time will tell, I guess, if we can... Uh, if we can if we can do that and, and uh, next time we're in that position maybe we'll pull it out i mean yeah it is i mean you look at just about every team they've had a tough loss at some point i mean pat ryan losing the 85 briar final uh you know randy furby losing in the world uh the first year they went too it's all been nobody's gotten through without something that helps them get stronger well, i don't think anybody learns anything from uh winning so uh i think i think you learn a lot from losing and, and especially you know losing big games like that so yeah i mean you know, we, we've certainly we've certainly dealt with it, and we've moved on, and um, hopefully, uh, hopefully, we'll learn from that. So, well, then I'm going to move on too here, Blake, and uh, ask you what you think of John Mead crossing provincial lines to play with Wayne Mada, putting together a team that's really geared for the Olympic trials rather than provincial playdowns. I think it's great. I think uh, John's a fantastic player, and uh, I think he'll do great with. Uh, with Wayne, you know, I I don't really, I, I mean, I think it just shows you the evolution of the game that people are starting to cross up provincial boundaries. I mean, I look at Chris Shelley, he's done the same with uh, with Brad Gushy's team, and um, it just shows you that, uh, you know, the professionalism that's required to play at a high level, and, and that, you know, in some cases, you might have to look outside your city or even your province to to find that combination. Yeah, you know, I, I mentioned that to Jim Waite last time after the Olympic trials. I said, I, I certainly can see a time when that happens, and he sort of didn't buy it, I don't think, at the time. But I don't see why why more guys wouldn't do it if that's the scenario. You know, if you can find three guys in your province that work for you, that's great. But if not, I think it definitely makes sense to look beyond. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's elusive to find that, that right combination. So, I mean, we had to pull a guy from, we, when we, there's three of us here in Edmonton, we play with a guy that lives five hours away in Grand Prairie. It's the evolution of the game, and, and to compete against these great teams, you you got to do whatever it takes. I can applaud uh, the move. Hey, let me ask you quickly before we go here. Why do you, you throw skip rocks when Kevin calls a game? You've done that with other players. What do you like about that setup? Well, for me, it just allows me to see more rocks from, from the end that I'm used to. Like, I, I like to see releases, and I like to see um, I like to see sort of the weight or how hard guys are throwing on certain spots. It just helps me with my weight control. The other thing, I've got lots of, you know, extra energy that, you know, I, I kind of like to use up sweeping, and I, I, and I tend to sort of fester if, I just, if I'm standing down at the other end. So for me, it's a great thing. For Kevin, um, you know, like he, he, I think he really enjoys calling the game and, and uh, certainly takes pride in that. And, and uh, you know, so f- for us, it's certainly a good mix. It's, Obviously, it's not something that works for everybody, but um, you know, it's certainly a system that's caught on, and I think a lot more teams are starting to use it. So, yeah, I think at least a lot more teams consider it, anyways, whether they do it or not. But it certainly seems to me you see a lot of teams just uh, at say a level below you guys, where it seems like it would make sense. Well, you see a lot of guys that should definitely maybe be throwing the last rock, but might not might not necessarily be the best person to call a game. I think it's a great thing to try, and 
you know, it certainly has paid dividends for a lot of teams. All right, Blake, we end with the run back. I give you a topic. You give me your thoughts in one to three words. Okay. Give or take. I'm, I'm, I'm awfully lax these days on this, but anyways, here we go. Eight end games. Love them. You do, eh? Absolutely. They are the, they're the best thing that's, uh, that's happened to curling in a long time. You know, I was a big fan. I, I still am a fan of them. I still like them. But I, I did think the final that you guys played against Kevin might have been more interesting with a couple more ends. But at the same time, I thought the first slam of the season with with uh, Glenn and Randy's, uh, th- that game was great as an 8-in game. So I guess it's, you know, you know it's give the or take. The only caveat is you need to have great ice. So. Right. Port Hawkesbury, Nova Scotia. Uh, just uh, an amazing town with amazing people in it. Uh, just amazed by how that you know, a town of 3,800 people can get behind an event like that. They had great crowds there, right? I mean, it was a shame it wasn't on television, actually. But Yeah, it was, it was fantastic. I mean, on Curl TV, it looked pretty much full. Was it full all the time? Yeah, I think so. I, I'm not sure how many people that, that stadium seats, but it's, uh, it was packed to the rafters. How about the attendance at the Alberta Men's Provincial Final? Um, I think it was all right. Maybe a little bit disappointing, but... Um, you know, it had a lot to do with the, the weather and the roads, too, and, and having an event in that small of a venue and not far from, you know, a major center. Right. So. Yeah, I was expecting a bit more when I saw that, but, but maybe it's just the location and the weather can make, make problems, that's for sure. Your corn broom supply? Getting a little short. Um, if anyone wants to buy the old uh, Midwestern Broom Country uh, Company and start it up again, I'd really appreciate that. Where do you get them from these days? Begboro and Steel. I think a few guys have a, have a little supply that I might be able to access, but it's uh, I usually got to catch them over a couple of beers to convince them to get them to me. So. And finally, exploding rocks. Uh, <laughs> Do you think that was really happening? Um, it may have. Uh, you know, you never know what happens to rocks in a in a venue where you know humidity is an issue, but. Um, Richard, Richard Hart didn't buy the exploding rocks theory, but uh, Kevin seemed yeah, pretty convinced. You know what? No comment. <laughs> it, was, it was it was probably the greatest theory I've heard in a while, though. I, I thought it was good good media, anyways. Yeah, good media. That's that's a good way to describe it. All right. See, I gave you a two word answer. All right. Uh, <laughs> finally, uh, Blake, I give everybody on the show this year a chance to mention their sponsors. I give you more uh, more more time than the CBC does. So so let me know who yours are. Absolutely. Uh, we were lucky to have uh, Wild Rose Pump Services out of Lloyd Minister, and they, uh, they actually came to the Port Hawkesbury Slam, bought a box, had a great big poster up. Uh, they, they sponsored Kevin Martin's team as well. Uh, I want to thank them for everything this year, as well as uh, Genmec ACL uh, out of Bonneville. They're a construction company out of there, and uh, a BDO, BDO uh, Accounting. They've been great this year, the local office in Edmonton, and, and then lastly, uh, Club Fit Corp. So. All right, Blake, thanks. I appreciate your time. Uh, good luck the rest of the way this season, and uh, hopefully we'll have a chance to talk again. Yeah, thanks, Dean. Take care. That's Blake McDonald on The Curling Show. Thanks for listening. Here's the pudding. Feel the power.